Welcome <laughs> to the Set Breaker Podcast. Today, we have a very, very special guest. We've got my very good friend, PK, the pastor kid, Paul Kim. Is that a bad way to intro you? <laughs> no, that's good. I that feel like good. I introduced you like a fucking WWE wrestler. PK, <laughs> the pastor's kid, Paul That's Kim. all good. I, I felt lame because in the beginning, I was looking at you, and then when you look, we looked simultaneously, we went, and you went, welcome. And I was like, <laughs> it was like, Shh. Planned, but yeah, guys. Uh, if you don't know who PK is, PK is the founder of Collaboration, and he's one of the OGs in the stand-up community, um, especially for the Korean Americans. And actually, um, some of, very some of you guys might notice, but the, the before I did my very first open mic, uh, watching PK's clips on YouTube in 2015 is what helped give me more courage to do my first set because I was like, wow, there's a Korean guy talking about asian stereotypes making it funny and cool and like like not being like hey, 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 fuck you fuck you but just make like weaponizing it in like a cool ass way you know thank you brother. that was fucking badass thank you yeah i appreciate that gotta give you your flowers for that thank you i didn't know the whole flowers thing at first until dumbfounded said it yeah. in clubhouse and if, you know we're at like a room of a few hundred people and he goes i just want to give pk his flowers for collaboration and like you know i, I this is how i know i'm getting old as fuck i didn't i wasn't hip to the term yet right like and so i was like thanks dumb like you've never given me flowers before and everybody in the room just cracked up but i know they're laughing at me i thought they're laughing at yeah and i was like oh damn okay you know you're getting old when you have to like look up you know hip-hop dictionary i do that all the time yeah all uh, the time i didn't even start saying oh give you your flowers until few weeks ago because everybody says it yeah and now i just say it well there was another this is how i know i'm always like learning from dumbfounded yeah. right and he one time he this is a long time ago he said uh like 10 years ago his friend was thirsty like i didn't know that what that term was oh. he kept saying because and then we were at a restaurant yeah, yeah. and he's just like yeah man he's always hanging out with me because like, he's thirsty and uh I just, I literally was, well, then just fucking give him some water. Like, I didn't understand, like, what the hell he meant. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, getting old is not just physical. It's your cool card. You start losing your cool card. Mm, you know? I, I feel that. And you have to own, like, a whole other. What are you talking about? You're way younger, man. What are you talking about? I'm dude, old. dude, do you I'm know what 45. happened to me a few days ago? There was a, there was a little, was like, 10-year-old kid at my friend's house, and he, he doesn't have a dad. <laughs> and then he just... He just started like talking shit to me and roasting me. He's like, yeah, you and your bald head and crooked ass teeth. I was like, what the fuck? Was, and then he jumped up. He's like like four foot tall. He jumped in the air and bitch slapped me in the back of my what? head. And I got so mad. I was like, hey, 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 hey. Wait. Hey, you don't do that. Ten-year-old kid? Ten-year-old kid. I got fucking slapped upside the head. I was, and I was thinking, if I was your dad, I would fuck you up. That's pretty crazy. I know. You know what the problem was? I kept playing around with him. I was like, hey, hey, hey. You know, and then when Look, I get why are you? Huh? Where are you hanging out with a ten year old kid? Okay, okay. What just is, to clarify, what's the context here? <laughs> I'm I'm at my friend's. Uh, he's a fellow comedian, and uh, they always have like ra son. random kids. No, not his son. His uh, mother in law's coworker's son, uh, a grandson was there randomly. So there's random kids that come by, and then you know they just, just hanging out. They they just want to like try to talk to us because we're the only guys there, and they're like, oh you know you're older. But then when you get too friendly with them. Then they start disrespecting they think you. Too, they think there's no limit. Yeah, they try yeah. to push the limit. Dude, they were pushing the limit. That kid, oh my well, god, he he doesn't have a dad, right? He doesn't have a dad. That's, That's why he does that. Big, yeah, exactly. And when I told right. him, I was like, hey, "You don't do that." He was doing a smile, big smile, and he looked like he wanted to cry because you know, like the, like a weird rejection. Uh, uh, like I want your acceptance, but like fuck you, <laughs> you know, just like eh. it was very strange. Uh, you you've seen that. That was a really good breakdown of that. Psych <laughs> psychological breakdown. Yeah, yeah. Weird rejection. I want your approval. I'm smiling big and I'm going to slap you in the head. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just trying to get your attention in any way possible because he's starving for some sort of like older male figure yeah. to just pay attention to him. And so the only way he knows is like, quick, I just got to fucking roast this guy just talk shit. and then smack him in the head. Dude, I would, if my son smacked me in the head, <laughs> dude, I can't, I've, I've never hit them, but that hundred percent, I would hit him. Like yeah. are you crazy. <laughs> like, are you like, explain oh, it immediately why you just did that. And like, yeah. if you didn't have a legit explanation, I would just, but my dad, <laughs> my dad used to smack me, man. Yeah, for sure. And I, he never did it. I, I have friends whose dads, smack them abusively and it always came out church retreats the yeah. last night everybody's crying and people would open up 
You know what I'm saying? And then uh, like always the uh, domestic violence abuse came out, especially Korean families, man. It's like swept under the rug. It came out at church camps, church retreats. My, my dad never, I never felt it was abusive. I, I deserved it every time. Uh, but yeah, he definitely smacked me, belted me. He uh, ruler. But uh, my mom smacked me. But I deserved it. Every single time wow, I deserved it. Really? Yeah. yeah. I never felt like it. But I'm lucky. I never felt like they did in an abusive way like most of my, a lot of my friends. Me. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of my friends got it. I was it, like, what did I do? Got, I it, like, got it bad. Yeah. 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 He's like, oh, these popsicles, disgusting. He cares. Like <laughs> <laughs> just for no reason. Yeah. Just out of nowhere. I was like, what the fuck is going on? But, um,. <laughs> You're the first Korean person I, I heard. Popsicles, disgusting. <laughs> that, okay, that's a fake example, but it was it was along the lines of no, just I that level you. of ridiculousness. Just, but yeah. but yeah, you're the first Korean person I heard that it was actually like I deserved it. Every yeah, single every time. single time. Wow. Yeah, it, you know, my dad grew up without a dad. He didn't know how to. His dad died when he was six. He didn't know how to act like a dad, mm. and so knowing that was also like okay. Well, he was very loving all the other times, but. You know, when he said come on by a certain time and then I blatantly disrespected and it was like way late. Yeah, of course he, he taught me a lesson, but I deserved it, you know? And in a way I look back like, wow, he did it out of love. He didn't do it like a lot of my friends' dads where they come home drunk and then it's like they're it's not out of love, it's just it's not a, for fun. they're not for fun. <laughs> <laughs> just 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 they're releasing some crazy you know it's horrible but it's like super saiyan rage there yeah there's internal rage maybe work maybe their boss treats them like shit they have to hold it up a lot of the uh, here's a big problem in the korean community culturally is men are not allowed to express themselves you know that's yeah. a big problem. I, I, I formed a mastermind group with seven Korean dads where I live in the Glendale area, La Crescenta, and, uh, and uh, we meet every two months for the past three years. Over, over pandemic, it was all Zoom. I think now four years now. It's the best thing. All of us are like, this, this thing is so important mm -hmm. and it's helped us. We drink, we talk shit, but most of all, we open up. We, we talk about business, finance, money matters, husband, being a dad, but one thing we do is like we go around and we li we literally in an organized way open up mm -hmm. and uh that one thing all of us have said like man that's that's helped us so much because girls open up like it's nothing like oh, girls open up day. as soon as they see each other yeah. like girls talk and whatever dude i get texts from my home girls just like oh my god i had a bad day i'm like i didn't ask for that yeah yeah, yeah. the old girls just they have don't to, care. yeah yeah but yeah. guys will won't open up unless it's like they're really drunk yeah. or like some sort of crazy fight happens and then they break do you know why i'm like this you know Cuba, <laughs> have you seen boys in the hood yeah, 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 yeah. Cuba jr in his room just punching you know? just fuck you fuck. like you know i'm sure every guy's had that moment where you you think about a guy you're like fuck it like you go through some thing but you don't regularly talk about it doesn't have to be emotional you're just talking about hey this is how's it going in your family this is what's going on in my family it's not going that great whatever right it's like just that like 10 minutes you open up to your brothers your homies that won't judge you like i've been jerking off a lot more than i've ever during the pandemic right like these are things that church small groups have but you can't get 100% real with your church oh, small no, group. You, you can't. Know? You can't. Like, you can get, actually, some church small groups, the good ones, you can get 90% real, I, I think. But I don't know if you can be, like, you know, like 100% real about your porn addiction, your drug addiction. Maybe there are some church small groups. I don't know. I, but with these, guy, with these guys, it's they're my brothers and we I, I feel and and the important thing is we all live around each other so you never feel like you're an isolated island when you get married and you have kids if you don't have that you start feeling like an island and you get isolated and then guys you guys start going crazy especially korean american guys or korean guys like you just go to work you're not allowed to ever express your emotions or feeling like comedians we're lucky we get to do that yeah all the time it's like therapy they don't do that a lot of Korean guys, Asian guys. It's not just Asian culture. A lot of like guys in general. A lot of conservative patriarchal cultures where the men are supposed to be leaders. You never show weakness. Don't open up. 
you can, it's eventually you're a human volcano you can't hold it inside forever it's gonna come out in one way or another on the fucking golf course and guys you know what i'm saying <laughs> guys are crazy at the bar it just comes out when people are like what like it, because they're holding it all inside yeah. you gotta let it out talk about real meaningful shit not like bullshit like a lot of guys can go golf all day and never talk about one meaningful thing all day mm. Just, you know, partying, drinking, golfing. I don't, I'm not a golfer, but I just know that, like, I, because at the end of the day, I know that they t- tell me, like, yeah, like, if you ask a simple thing about their friend, like, I don't know, like, they don't really talk about anything, just like, it's yeah, just. It, it's, like, it's like they're like a, a computer program just crashing, that, what? Yeah, yeah. They it, don't know how to respond. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, you can Google mastermind group for those who are listening and uh i think it's one of the most important things for people to do as we get older like i would say 30 and above i I learned it from this doctor dr bill dorfman this leadership conference at ucla and he said you know everything he was saying i kind of like i've heard before except this one thing he goes i'm in a mastermind group uh with a bunch of other guys i mean he's in his 50s he goes after 30 it's it's the most important thing you can do with your life is have a consistent group of friends that meet regularly. You just go eat, talk, but it's like scheduled mm-hmm. so that you know, like, okay, well, after you talk about all the bullshit, sports, cars, girls, whatever, right? Okay, well, yeah, but how are you doing? Like, how are you really doing? Like, are you all right? I'm gonna go, <clears throat> no, man, no, I'm not. Like that, right? Sometimes it gets like that a little bit. Uh, Not usually, not right off the bat. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to skip to that because I just yeah yeah no, we usually right off the bat <laughs> maybe one day it probably will be we're we're getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter right yeah. but it's organic it's not like you know what I'm saying yeah like oh tell me how you guys feel not what like, fucked up thing happened today never like that yeah, yeah it's more like it's like this okay this one thing has helped me so much we go what's your daily what do you what's your daily routine like and we all went around and talked about it right yeah. And just knowing, hearing all the, okay, I can get up at 6 30. I go, okay, I gotta help make the breakfast and we gotta get everyone stressed out again. I gotta drive it. Just hearing everybody's daily routine stress helps you so much that when you're going through, you know, everybody, are, they're all going through the same shit. Like, you know, they are. Mm-hmm. They're all stressed out. They're all stressed out about money. They're all going through shit with their wife. Like, they're, everyone's just hard, trying to make hard to make it work, be a good dad. But then you don't feel alone. The the isolation is what man. The pandemic. It, that's why so many more people overdosed. Mm. You know, depression is because they they didn't have a way to connect. And sometimes it's pride to just pick up the phone and hey, how are you doing? And just want to talk because you're afraid that the person might be busy or. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, or you don't want to seem like, like desperate. desperate or like, oh, I'm not, I'm not a bitch. I can do this. But if there's one time you, you shouldn't feel desperate, it's during a global pandemic where people are <laughs> fucking dying yeah. and you feel alone. But still, people probably felt like, so maybe, you know, you just want to hook up with people, which is totally understandable, too. That's another way of coping with like, you know, but that only lasts for so long, too. It feels empty. So it's like, basically, you just need some friends that you can regularly open up to and you know they're not gonna judge you you know yes that's the part where uh i, I grew up in church and i, I love that i'm very thankful i believe in god but i never felt that 100 percent openness there was one other friend that i had we both were praise leader we were <laughs> we, we were opened up about like masturbation right because yeah. it was never talked about at church and whenever you did people always like shunned you like hey, hey why yeah. you talk about what are you talking about them? Aren't you the praise it? Like you could never be real. But me and him, we always talk about how like, yeah, man, did you realize when you, when you jerk off a lot during the week, like, cause we chose the songs too. Back then it was transparencies. I don't know if you remember. Oh yeah. It goes on the projector yeah. and, it go, and you can use the little marker to write on it and shit. And then you feel bad. And sometimes the girl doing the transparencies is the girl that you have a crush on and you're like thinking about during the week. Right. And like, <laughs> The spank was, bank. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's the one you have, like, I don't know, you guys have a little thing going on. She's yeah. looking at you. But yeah, we're like, isn't it funny? Like, when you, if you jerked off a lot that week, the songs that you chose were a lot more about, like, creating me a clean heart. Like, all the, like, yeah. like you know. Lead me to the cross. Yeah, like, refiner's fire. It was all about, like, confession. Like, burning the sins. Yes. Or, you know, cleansing. But, but if you did it as much that week, it was all celebration songs. Yeah. I did, all, I did all right. Yeah, it's just one way 
Jesus. <laughs> oh, that's you grew up in church? I did. And I quit. But uh, I quit. <laughs> it's yeah, like I quit. Piano. It was like that. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know what? I got what I needed. I'm cool. I'm cool. How long Whatever. did you go? Dude, I went my whole life because, you know, forced by my parents. And then so I you stopped never going. to go? No, well, no, nah, not really. I, but I always felt like something was kind of weird. I, I was like, I don't really want to do this. And then I stopped when I started doing drugs in high school. And I went back so I could quit drugs. <laughs> I was like, I need this. But even t- every time I prayed, I was like, please, please, Lord, help me quit. Help me quit, Lord. Help me quit. Like but genuine, even then, genuine. It was genuine. But at the same time, a party was like, man, you don't believe in this shit. You just, you're just trying to, you're praying to anything at this point because you just want to stop. So it was but like, you, I half you, believed it. You didn't 100%. I, I tried so hard. Really? But deep yeah. down inside, I just kind of knew, man, this ain't, this isn't really it. You know, so, but I don't know. I mean, we used to go to church. It was more like a help me with the drug thing. I was, yeah, I was desperate as fuck. I was like, any, any, whatever is out there, I don't fucking know what, but right now it's God and through Christianity, please, please. Yeah. 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 Uh, In that way, I think it's, it's, it can be good, you know, religion. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think for a lot of people, it is good. For me though, man, I just, it's crazy how I took this break from church and now because of my kids, because I want some sort of structure and I do believe in God, but, and if I were to roll the dice on any religion, maybe only because I grew up in it, you know, that's why I can't, it's like, I hate when all the religious people hate on each other, religion. It's like, well, maybe they grew up in it. So that's why they're a Muslim. Maybe they, they grew up in a Jewish house. Isn't that, isn't that funny how like a lot of Jewish kids become Jewish and they grew up in Jewish a lot of Muslim kids grew up in Muslim like it's like maybe because I grew up in a Christian household if I were to roll the dice on any faith like that for me that's it God Jesus is Jesus the son of God that can save me from my sin I, I struggle with that if I were to put my faith yes right but I don't live that and so I'm like if I don't live it do I believe it am I if I'm not living it because if you really believed it would you live it according to the Bible because I read the Bible I was forced to you know what I'm saying like yeah front to back and I was a Bible study teacher and then I used to go to early morning prayer and then I went to discipleship training and then I like really got into like you know apologetics defending the Bible and then I used to like evangelize on the street you know like I really was damn you did in the street too yeah damn you went in one of the funniest moments at Third Street Promenade was uh, <laughs> Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica one of my friends Brian he <laughs> he used to be a gangster and he became me like Christian hardcore and, and we were paired in twos like Mormons right yeah like going around and uh, with those rollerblader, he was all like, we just like stop him dead in his tracks, right? What's up? And start talking about God, you believe in God. And uh, I remember Brian goes, you know, you don't believe everything happens for a reason, right? And that guy, <laughs> that guy was like, nah, man. I don't like and Brian's like, man, everything happens for a reason. Like l- to literally right when my friend said that, yeah. a bird like shit on him. <laughs> on his hand on like his hand? like just shit on him and i was cracking i was like oh my god dude and so uh i don't know i've got a sense of humor man it's like that if everything happens for a reason but uh but that guy like rollerbladed away when that happened he was like ah. <laughs> he was <all> like, <laughs> doing little spins like i like the shoot him a yeah. pow, 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 shoot in the way for a reason yeah. So but, uh, a sucker? yeah that happened i was hardcore man and that's why I can never let go. Like, I do believe it, all of this comes from something. Yeah. Right? All, if you think about it, like, just your body, like, what happens when you chew a piece of food and what that has to go through, uh, all the systems in your body for you to have energy just to keep moving forward. Like, I do mm-hmm. believe there's something, but I don't believe that anybody knows at all. No one knows. No one knows what happens to us when we die. We all have guesses that's true you know and nobody 100 percent knows oh shit I'm hot all day. i know i know it's hot in here we don't have air conditioning this oh, place okay. fuck it's like, oh, this okay. is this is what i have to deal with every summer so i want to i want to fucking die but it m- mentally trains me just kidding it fucking sucks but, <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah you know what's the good remember and relating to that i saw a video of uh, 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 like a like a somebody taking a cell phone and then recording first person shooter style, pulling open a kangaroo's pouch and like there's a little kangaroo marsupial in its pouch and I was just thinking that's crazy how things have evolved for the baby to be protected but also the instincts of the parent to protect that to keep things going like just how everything every animal 
has its own protection mechanism. You know, like birds that have nests high in trees, right? And I don't know, it's just interesting. And like fucking eggs. <laughs> Not that they can do anything. What the fuck is an egg really going to protect from? Nothing. Uh, Not much. Even a possum could fuck up an egg. It keeps them probably warm, right? A little bit. It has to keep them there, the heat. That's probably That's the only. True. You're right. No, you're right. Like, yeah. you, you can't, like, physically, there's no protection. It's worthless. But you're right. Think about it. <laughs> if it falls out, just crack. Yeah. But warmth. Because even, even when a, you have a, a blanket and it's freezing, just your body heat, man. Like, it's you next know? level. Like, boxer briefs. Dude, when I, I can't wear boxer briefs in summer. I can't wear boxer briefs. Because it yeah. just, like, heats too, up my, yeah. oh, my shit to the I'm point not, where I, can't. I get Ti- angry. I gave up tidy whities boxer briefs. Long time ago, I can. I would have hoped you gave up tidy whities a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm like, PK, please don't be wearing tidy whities right I now. I tried it one time. Have you ever tried it just to see what it feels like? I thought like? about it. I no, thought and about then it. never again. You're just like, you're like, no way. After you watch Will Ferrell movies, he's always wearing tidy whities. You're like, there's uh, something about them. There's got to be something, and it's yeah. just no, no. And then you leave pee drops, and then if it's if you're dehydrated, it's kind of colored. And you're like, no way, dude. Yeah, that's why I keep drinking this water to keep my uh, my pee clear. Why? I don't know. It just lets me know I'm hydrated and I feel better. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, so so uh, let's talk, I want to talk about uh, uh, your stand-up journey. I want to know um, when you started and what you got, what got you to even begin to do that because this was back then when there was even less Asians doing stand-up, right? Uh, so, like, go how far back? Just when you started. Um. I'm mean, curious about it. Yeah. I, I think it really like the the reason why uh, I really got into it is because my friend gave me an Eddie Murphy cassette tape that I got to borrow, um, and I wasn't allowed to listen to that. No way, like vulgar as a preacher's kid. I wasn't even allowed to listen to radio music. And then so when my parents didn't know, I had a little radio thing in the closet. I had to bring it out and put it back in my little <laughs> hide my little radio thing. I think that's where that's where it starts, man. When you're a kid, when you hide stuff. And then, it, like later on, it turns to like porn or whatever. Um, it evolves. What's up? It, it evolves. evolves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, but for me, it was like first like secular music, like listening to the radio, and then it was like Eddie Murphy. And then when I heard Delirious, I was like, like, w- like blew my mind. And then I remember the older Korean youngs at church. Some of them used to say some of the lines, and then I knew, oh, that's cool. Like I'm a, I'm like sixth, seventh grade, and I already know. And they were like, I remember these college. Students at church were like, you don't got no ice cream. Oh. Man, you ain't get your daddy's on the whiff. And they didn't know I, as a kid, I heard it and heard them saying like, oh yeah, like that, this is cool. And I just remember like the first time seeing it on VHS after hearing it on cassette, I'm like, whoa, like he's 20 years old, you know, in his red leather thing. And he is, it's like 15,000 seater in DC. And he's just rocking it and he's crushing it and it's funny and it's so, you know, original. And it's like, I'm like, man, if you could do that as a job, that's crazy. It's just planted the seed. And then I saw Johnny Carson every night, his monologues. Timing was just impeccable. His swag is like next level. Even when he messed up on a joke, people laughed even harder. Like, because he would like, like his facial expression was like, what? Like. If you don't think that's funny that's on you like he, he just mastered that and um it just planted the seed like oh wow because at school i would like do a lot of uh stand-up bits with friends and they loved when i did it and i realized oh okay like there's something but it was, i never really thought but then in high school and college i was leading praise at church and i would always sneak in little jokes in between and get little laughs sometimes the youth pastor would be annoyed like just sing the song you know <laughs> but i'd always try to like get some time in he the pastor has a red light at the back <laughs> i'm lit i'm lit one minute one minute left <laughs> i'm like i'm in the middle of the joke <laughs> so the that that was like more seeds right there's just all these seeds planting and then when i started collaboration um which is uh, for those in our collaboration is uh, a string of Asian nightclubs where we uh, made sure that the ratio was one guy to one girl because before it was all sausage parties. So we had two lines and we let people in. One girl, one guy. One girl, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> collaboration, <laughs> was, collaboration was an Asian talent show that started LA and then Chicago, New York, Atlanta as a nonprofit and we uh, 
kept it going. It was awesome. Like at the, at its peak, we had six thousand people come to the shrine. Um, for me, it was like my glory days, man. It's like when I my my Al Bundy moments are like back in those days. It was like man, it was it was amazing. But that uh, when I was hosting, I I got to do my bits, like start working on my bits, and it's way easier. I think most comedians, are, people who don't do comedy think like oh man like it's scary to do it in front of a big crowd no it's like way better to do jokes in front of a big crowd than a a 10 person you know open mic because someone's gonna laugh right like the the chances yeah. like of you bombing in front of six thousand people and not only that if you hit that roaring sound that you get it takes you back to like in seventh grade i saw eddie murphy like do this and I'm not like nowhere close to that level, but but I'm living this moment right now. Like what I saw Eddie Murphy do when he was twenty. Like I'm I'm on stage. I'm not the main attraction. I'm hosting, but one of my bits just hit, and it's just the first time I did that. If you're feeling me, sit still. I collaborate, dude. That like not just ha ah, that oh, you know, like like a tidal wave. Of yeah, just love. Yeah. Of like, like, man, I've never had so much big dick energy in my life. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> just that, like, in a good way. You know what I'm saying? Like, wow, that was that was amazing. You know, and so, just that journey. Eddie Murphy, thank you, Johnny Carson, and then a whole bunch of other comedians like Brian Regan, of course, Dave Chappelle, like you know, all the Chris Chris Rock, Bring the Pain, that VHS tape. I watched it twenty times. Deaf Comedy Jam. There was a late night infomercial. You can buy all, the whole set when VHS. I bought the whole thing, credit card. I watched that over and over and over. This is when my friends and I. Uh, I party late. I'm a late bloomer. I started partying at 21. We all got an apartment in Westwood, four of us, and uh, we were smoking weed a lot. Friend had a three foot glass bong. We were just after work, just blazing, watching Def Comedy Jam. That whole thing, yeah. over and over and over. I watched it five times, and some of the. Some of the tapes, like the Chris Tucker one and the Bernie Matt, I saw like 10 times, seen it like 10 times. So black comedians had a big effect to thank you to all the black comedians who kept it real. And, uh, you know, it, just that journey uh, all the way till when I started going to open mic um, at uh, Laugh Factory, it was Tuesdays. And I was doing sales at LA Times, the food section. I would Tuesdays get up earlier to get all my calls in and, try to get some ad sales and if I got an ad sale, boom, I would just go straight to the laugh factory because I'm done for the day. And then you would wait from like noon to like 8 p.m. Sometimes you could get to 2 p.m. But the first 20 people and you get two minutes, sometimes it's first 15 people, you sign up, there'd be fights. You can't leave the line. Like you know? fist fights? Yeah. Shit. Like guys are like, hey man, I, you, no, people cross each other's names out. You can't leave, dude. People would, would wear diapers. Fuck. Yeah. To like piss and shit themselves. To, so they can't. You can't leave. You know. Oh or wow. Or if you haven't, you t you need to have an ally. Like, hey man, dude, this, some of these comedians left their city from hometown and are living in an apartment in Hollywood with no furniture in it, eating ramen, and they can't go back home unless they make it. You know what I'm saying? Like Damn. that dedication. That's it. The good thing about you and I being a comedian in Southern California is we have the comfort. You know what I'm saying? We know the place. We never feel this like, you know, if you go to another city or town, there's always the stress of like, dude, I got to I got to make it all. I got, you know, but it's a double edged sword because that drives some people. It crushes some people and ruins them. But don't, but it, you know, makes diamonds out of some people because they know like, I can't, I can't go back home without making it without doing something i gotta have my name on something you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so they do they go way harder so that's why even though i've been in comedy for like 15 years a lot of times it's only once a week mm -hmm. sometimes i get to like a good week for me i'm getting three spots but i remember bobby lee was like you're not really doing stand-up comedy unless you're doing four times a week and that hit me because i then i knew like i've been doing it for 15 years but i've really been doing it for seven years i, I cut it in half because your total amount of time on stage, you know what I'm saying? But for me, it was different. My game was like, I would do Laugh Factory, and then I I uh, have I MC galas. I've done hundreds of banquets and galas. That's a whole other game, right? Like you gotta know it's a headache. And and then at weddings, I've done 500 weddings. So that's a whole other thing where it used to be stressful, but it's like 
cake for me now. I mean, right? those are those go for like hours too. Dude, I'm there for 12 hours. I not only yeah. that, I help I me DJ and I we set it up. It's very humbling, like being in a suit and I'm taping on the wires, and then I run into old high school. Hey, PK, yeah. like the I've run into some dicks, and they go, "Oh, you're you're doing this? I thought you'd be bigger by now." Ugh. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like those off. little jabs. Yeah. I've got I got a few of those, yeah. but um. And it like it's hard to like you, know, you have to like kill your ego because you're professional, but inside you're just like that motherfucker. You're Cuba Gooding Jr. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> fucking asshole. But uh, it's like uh, you know you just got to do all. So that's a whole other game too. I'm doing all these MC stuff. So like I just always felt like I'm in this minivan lane, and then watching all these other friends that I know blow up, mm-hmm. and you just got to stay like positive as long as you're moving forward you can never just stop just mo- keep moving forward whatever lane you're in because you're always going to feel someone else is doing more and feel inadequate you know even i bet you i was looking at freaking the kardashians like some of them have like 160 some of them have like 300 million like the younger ones have three i'm sure the older ones are like freaking bitches like yeah. they have, the older ones have uh like 160 the kardashian and then the jenners have like 300 right or whatever and i bet you even they compare even even though they're in the hundreds of millions yeah. of followers they feel the same kind of someone else is ahead you know yeah. which is stupid you know but uh but you can't help it it's human nature man like my friends of randall park jimmy oyang i know ali wong like they didn't just blow up like Ken Jeong. They they didn't just blow up like they blew up like on another level. Like you know, like you know people when you're on a text level, you know, like back and forth. And then once they blow up, it's more like a hey, like a hoping you'll get a text back level. Oh, yeah, and yeah. you can't hate on them. You're not. They're just they're just on another level. They're, they're like they're so busy. You know, you're getting like movie deals. And you're like, hey man. <laughs> yeah, they got can, too much on their mind. Can you do uh can you do Asian night like next <laughs> month? You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like I throw Can it, you host my open mic? <laughs> I throw it out there and uh sometimes they reply back, yeah, which yeah. is cool, but I can't get mad at them if they don't. It's like they're making bank doing other stuff. Dude, and if I'm yeah. on that level too, I'm not okay. I, I know I'm gonna get all these like DMs and stuff. I can't reply to everybody. It's yeah. like you can't get mad. Some people get mad, dude. It's like you gotta understand. That's it's like I'm on the tiniest level of fame and the little things that people do it makes gives me a little notice of like damn if i ever like blow up it's good to know like some people have feel this entitlement yeah yeah of like i don't know man to your time to your attention to your life i had this one guy ask me dude this is true i'll show you the text <laughs> after i want your advice on what i should do mm-hmm. this guy's like uh uh he looks like he's middle-aged i've never met him before yeah right and uh he um he goes hey man i've i've cancer and uh, wait i got that too shut up this, that guy. this white dude with the the shit. i was like i was and no and he goes i got cancer you're my favorite comedian can he you, said that can you sh- <laughs> i didn't respond at first i was like i felt bad but i was like wait a minute there's, there's something okay, really was, weird I about was, this <laughs> i was feeling bad about this until this moment right here okay Hey, I don't want to put okay. I don't want to put his name on blast because I feel bad for no, this guy. No, that's not to say the name. No, because I then you look at all his videos. It's all selfie videos. Right? Yeah, we're just talking. And I'm like, you need some reference point. Like, I need I need one other friend or family. Member. I need someone to let me know that this guy's like okay, like not. You know what I'm saying? Dude. And and you telling me this lets me know. No, because I, I asked somebody. I'm about- blocking him. I'm blocking in this fool, and uh, and and I can't believe, first of all, that. He told both of us that we're his favorite comedian. Please. Hey, hey, motherfucker. I'm your favorite comedian. <laughs> I'm your favorite comedian, you liar. Yeah, so uh, I'll just read the, to the people. That's we hilarious. Got the, he copy-pasted hey, hey, it. Hey, hey, hey. How many, how many comedians do you think he sent this to? I actually know one person that followed him back and I asked him, hey, do you know this hey, guy? How he, many, said, he said, I don't, he's like, I don't know. The, but the, the amount of people he sent it to? Probably hundreds, every single one. Hundreds. Maybe thousand. Thousands? Potentially. I but mean, you don't think that he, he doesn't think comedians talk to each other? <laughs> 
How are you going to say we're all your favorite? Fool? Yeah. That's where your, your whole bullshit story comes out. Why don't you just be like, <laughs> I have cancer, right? Yeah. And, oh, but here's what bothered me about it. The way he asked was so fucking entitled. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he yeah. He goes, hey, you're my favorite comedian. Wait, wait, wait. I should read it I'm to everybody. Oh, yeah, I should, read, okay. it, read this. Guys, this so, is... So entitled, man. W- w- word for word, what he says right here. I'm a fan of your work. I got cancer, and is there any way you can send me some merch like an autograph photo? I would appreciate it very much before I pass away. Thank you for your time, and God bless you. Hope to hear from you soon. Oops. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, mute out his name. I, I had, <laughs> but the funniest part is he put no fucking punctuation. Hey, there's, no, there's no comma. Hey, there's hey, nothing. Hey, 100%. I'll show you mine. Hey, one thing about you, bro. I, I got to get it up to you. You told Mike you're a fan of his work and that you have cancer. You told me, no, you told me, it's a little different. He changes it up a little bit. You told me that I was your favorite comedian. Oh, he said that. Hey, you're all right now. You're all right now, bro. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. But, but, yeah. Hey, hey, I got to tell you, bro, stop doing this. You're going to get blown up, bro. Like, you're, you're going to get caught. And this thing that you're using cancer is so whack. Yeah. And it's shitting on people who really have cancer. If you yeah, because it's it. gonna. What if somebody does and we just ignore them? It's a boy who cried wolf. Die. Boy, who, boy who cried wolf. Yeah. But not only that, the way you're asking is so entitled. Uh, he, the way he was, yeah. Anyway, can you send me some autograph? Uh, he told me out autograph DVDs, merch. Oh, you got yours July three. Mine was uh, yesterday, July sixteenth, which means he's been like like editing and revising his pitch. <laughs> He's been hitting the open mics, practicing. Yeah. No, okay, no wonder. That's why I'm his favorite comedian. He's gonna his message. But not only that, for me, he like no, no, but no, wait, wait. But then no, for I, me, four days later, he sent, please, <laughs> just one word, please. No, for me, he demanded it. <laughs> did he? Let me see. Yeah, he. Me see. No, not only that. Yeah. So I go, am I really a favorite comedian? Where did you Where did you uh, find out from? And he just wrote, YouTube, and then he went. Um, is that okay? I'm sick. I really can't go places. Man, you're full of shit. You're full of bull <laughs> shit, bro. Hey, you're you're. We're not saying your name, yeah. all right? But you you better stop doing this, man. Like you, you have a problem, and uh, yeah, yeah, man. It don't stop it's doing weird. this, man. Come it's on, weird. It's just stop doing this. I don't know what. First of all, me and Mike's merch. Is worthless. It doesn't. Co- what are you? Are you trying to collect like comedians merch that don't? That I mean, doesn't, mine doesn't even exist. I don't even have. I don't any even merch. have much. But, I was, <laughs> but I'm just saying. I want merch like, later. I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> if we had our own shirts and we autograph and we send it to him, what is he collecting? Like hundreds of mid-leveling comedians merch with that's worthless and he's gonna eBay it. Yeah, but oh, who? But who knows? Who knows? What if he actually believed in us? And that's realize, maybe he's trying to hold on to like yeah, a just stock. In, like baseball cards. Like, yeah, baseball card like, like stock, cards. stock options. Yeah, yeah. You know what? That's it, that's a long term play. That's mm. f- fucking lame, right? Like, what, yeah. are you, what are you doing with your time, bro? There's so much better things to do with your time. What are you doing? But you know what's cool hey. though? This guy's not Asian, but he's hitting up Asian comedians. How do you so, know he's not? He, he's hitting up only Asian. He may be hitting up other I, comedians. I know, but I just want to imagine that in my head. Okay, I I got cancer, right? Yeah. I got cancer. You are my favorite comedian. See, is there any way you can send me some merch, like a couple of T-shirts, XL? Damn, he sent you the some size. Of your sta- yeah, and some of your stand-up specials on DVD or CD. Sign, like so specific. Right? I appreciate it very much. Before I pass away, <laughs> before I pass away, thank you for your time and and. Uh, God bless, dude. Uh, talking about using God's name in vain. Oh, because God he, bless. He probably you checked hope, your profile hope too. Hope to hear from you soon, right? And I gave him benefit of the doubt. Hey, I'm I'm sorry to hear your illness. Hope you get better. I'm sorry. I don't have any merch. I don't have CDs. Whatever. Hope you feel better. And he wrote back autograph picture. Oh, that's entitlement right there. He's telling you what to do. I go. I don't have any autograph shirts or DVDs. He just writes back autograph picture. Then what the hell, dude? This has actually been, I'm so glad it, that you told me, this has actually been playing in my head and I'm like, like half of me was like, yeah, dude, no one would be, no one would be that devious to use cancer. So uh, like maybe I'll try to send him something because I feel bad. Like uh, what if he dies and I just brush that off, right? I thought about that too. I thought about that and that's bad karma. And the other half of me was like, this guy's full of shit, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you just verify, this guy's full of shit. He's fucking full of shit. But why is he doing this? Do you know how I knew he was full of shit? I had a feeling. Is when I went to his profile and I, I actually watched some of his videos, 
and I, I was like, this dude doesn't have fucking cancer. A guy with cancer would not be just chilling on, on like, p- fucking doing selfie videos. He'd be tied up to some shit, you know, with, like, breathing mechanisms or, like, talking about his chemo or something or just saying, guys, I'm really fucked up. But he didn't even say that. I did my research just to be safe. That's why I, I, I felt better ignoring it. But yeah. at first, I felt but bad. It's such a weird thing to want. Tactic. No, but, like you're just just DMing thousand comedians saying you have cancer demanding you want their merch like demanding it pretty much like I'm like I don't have any uh, shirts and he's like okay autograph picture then I'm like fool who are you dude first of all first of all this is the worst sales pitch of all time right like I do recruiting I'm still like you have to introduce who are you yeah you're just telling people you have cancer and to send me stuff at least get ask, it to me. ask me how my day went or something. Or just like get or to hope know. you're well. It's the entitlement is crazy, man. Yeah. Like it's crazy, man. I pray for this guy, but honestly though, like don't do it again. If you keep doing it, man, uh, I'm gonna blow you up. Uh, put your name out there. I'll call the cops if needs to. You seem like you need help. I don't know what. Don't do this, man. Like, if there's even one person that gets scammed by this and like sends their stuff over to him. Like, I just feel like, I, you know what makes me feel like uh, all the old people that get scammed by all those like uh, telemarketers. Yeah, f- from different countries and, and he, stuff he, too. They, uh, oh. He's just thinking, I'll get some, they'll fall for it. What are you doing? What are you doing? Look man, you just need to stop. You just need to stop doing that. <sighs> That's so freaking weird, dude. <laughs> hey but i'm his favorite though <laughs> <laughs> you are his favorite i'm his favorite yeah oh you know i was wondering though so when, when, when you said bobby bobby lee said you gotta get up four times is he just saying like stage time stage time or like what is it like open mics or both or anything just anything open mic stage time anything anything, anything. Okay. well open mic is stage time because it's hard for me to get open show. mic is I, stage time I, I can't get four shows a week i'm not at that level dude, yet. dude open mic is stage time. it's like basically he's saying like you got to get on Period. the mic in front of people at least four times a week to i i agree with him to yeah. like w- once you have a bit and you got that momentum and you're like it, it hits a little bit and then the next day you're like let me tweak it a little bit and then like you got that momentum on that bit to like keep working on it but let's say you do for me for years Mm -hmm. i could only do it like once and then i'm thinking about it all week dude by the time i do it a comeback i'm doing it the exact same way the next week i'm not like oh because you went on stage actually there's there's seven days before i get to do it again Mm -hmm. and i'm not improving on that bit i am maybe over years slowly mm-hmm. but like a a working comedian is gonna carve that bit up for like a month and you like have it down you know what i'm saying you can have like a new hardcore bit sometimes in like yeah like in a week and then you feel like when you have that new bit it's that's i think that's one of the best feelings oh my god Here, when you have that yeah. when you get that new bit that hits Dude, that's one of the best feelings yeah, yeah. especially especially when like it's uh it's somewhat of like a kind of darker one and then people get sad from the get-go but it's like no that's not the point and then you find a way to take yourself out of it to, to not even just that but like before it starts it, it you like transition it to to for them to be, realize oh this is this is supposed to be funny and then they know that they're supposed to laugh at it because i just figured something out uh, the, the the dad's grave joke I, I figured it out yesterday at the show i was like yes <laughs> Finally, I was like, I, I couldn't figure it out for fucking like a month. And I, I finally figured it out. I saw you do that first video and I was like, what? <laughs> oh, when I was actually at the cemetery? Yeah, at the cemetery. <laughs> I was like, wait, what, what, what? That was funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that one was fucking, I like that. <laughs> but yeah. props to you, man. You've been grinding. I'm trying, but you know, it's just... Uh, you're grinding, man. You're doing your podcast. You're getting on stage. You're doing your TikTok videos, Instagram. You're doing... It's like... It's a grind, man. It's like... Uh, you just got to keep pushing content out there because there's so many people putting content out there. That's the game, yeah. too, is you're competing. It used to be a few voices here. That's why whenever there's a new app like Clubhouse or whatever, people just always rush. They want to be the first because you, you can amplify your megaphone bigger if you're first mover advantage you know True. like tiktok and uh whatever instagram so whatever is new you gotta like jump in and then just grind once you're in there and the, just grind 
which you are. Yeah, but with the videos, I've been kind of <clears throat> not as motivated lately because, I don't know, the creativity on my end is kind of lacking because I've been doing the same stuff. But stand-up has just, since I I hit this momentum of where like I'm starting to figure things out more for jokes, it's so fucking exciting. That's all I think about. That's the great thing about live stand-up is there's feedback. When you Media do videos, feedback. there's comments. Yeah. It doesn't hit the same. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not as real. Yeah. People hide behind all their mm, troll shit. You know what I'm saying? But like, when it's face to face, it's so, there's nothing better than live stand-up comedy. It's the most raw, vulnerable art form. If you're a lead singer in a band and you mess up, sometimes nobody even notices, right? Mm-hmm. If you bomb on a joke, you're naked, vulnerable in front of all these strangers. There's no running from it. You bombed, right? It's like, it hurts. It's you failed but then you're like fuck it you just keep moving forward you know and then you keep getting stronger like i think that it's the it's the most raw real vulnerable it's the best art form no i i I agree 100 percent and um and and the one issue with the video thing too on tiktok is you feel like you have to create the same type of things that hits and it's gonna hit because you you know it is but then you hate yourself because it's kind of like being on stage and doing Same a joke. joke you fucking hate. That was like your one of your first jokes, and you, and 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 you almost feel like you are dependent on it. I've been that I've, for years, year after year. A lot of times because if you host, mm-hmm. you got to get the room warm, and then so you like you can't be doing like, hey, here's my new jokes, you know, <laughs> and then bombing, and then the comedians are like, dude, what the hell, man, like. That host sucks. Like you're supposed to warm up the room, get people drinking. You know what I'm saying? Like get so. That's another thing too, is man. It's like if you're not doing like regular spots and you're only hosting. If people, if there's any hosts that are listening, you gotta like try to get out of that hosting phase. I mean, once in a while, I think hosting is always good. I think everyone should do it. But um, if you get stuck in that, like I was just stuck as a host. <sighs> You get so dependent on those, the hits, mm-hmm. and then you're like on a treadmill, man. Yeah. It's like a hamster in a wheel. You can't like get out of that, especially if you're only doing once a week. Then too, it's like, you know. So don't have kids, basically. Don't have kids. <laughs> so hard to do stand up when you have kids. I mean, they give you some material though, don't they? They give you material, but you gotta feed them pay the bills, provide for them. You have to up your salary three, four times just to live yeah. compared to like being single. You're, I have three human beings dependent on me. So my wife and I, we like, you know, basically another human and a half each, right? Like if we don't produce, they will starve, right? Like yeah. they will not function. We will be homeless. So it's like, that stress is always there, so that's number one. When that's all taken care of, then, like tonight, then I can go do a set, right? Mm-hmm. So, a 10 minute set, right? It's like, that ain't moving the needle for me, you know, but at least it keeps the dream alive because I know that, for me, it's like, I know a certain amount in my head I need to make for me to take a year off to just do comedy and then I can wow. just go hard, right? Mm-hmm. And that's like a few hundred thousand dollars that I need to put aside so that my wife and my kid, like, that we can just function, right? And with no stress and live and and she can not be like, like, this, are you crazy? You're gonna take a year off? No, I, I can't, I can't, I, I can I need. So it's like, I'm trying to save money for that and then that year, whenever it is, I'm 45, mm-hmm. hopefully before I'm 50, I can uh, at least try to like, you know, go from the first lane minivan into like maybe a little faster lane, you know, <laughs> yeah. where maybe I don't think I'll ever get in a movie as a bit main actor, but I would love to be a, a character, you know, like a, just like a character in a movie, you know, like a comedy, one of the characters, mm-hmm. I think it could be that, or like in a TV show, like I'm not an actor, like a main, but I just see like, there, you know, there's some like recurring characters. That'll I'll, be fun. Yeah. That'll be fun. You know, yeah. I would love to be like an Asian guy where they don't know if he's high or he's just cause he's Asian, right? Like just that guy, like yeah. and they're always wondering or um, like a, a guy, a, an Asian guy that just has like a really bad temper 
but it's like super nice otherwise you know like oh like that nice, quiet but just seething volcanoes and then after it just goes back to that because because that's me dude that's how yeah. that's how i am too like with korean guys we have that like super nice and then like once in a while just ah, and then i go back <laughs> to like all right i'm good, I'm good we for, have to let it out otherwise good for another six months but uh yeah i try to take, save money to take a year off that's that's a goal dude i think i think that's so great that you know with with everything you've created up to this point with your family and everything you still are thinking about stand up you still are planning around that you know i'm I, never I gonna give up i think that's fucking awesome rodney dangerfield he uh people don't know he um he stopped stand up for a long time to provide for his, his family his mm -hmm. kids and then when they went to college then he did it again and then he like came with like you know a whole other big dick energy i you know i ain't got no respect you know nobody mm. respects me like um and so uh and then those one-liners he was just crushing it you know but he did that all at the tail end of his career like a stand-up comedy is one of the few things where you could be older you know not like you know, it's not like you know a lot of uh rappers or um athletes you know yeah. there's more of a time limit but with stand-up you know, you can uh, you can keep going, and you can only get better too. That's the cool thing about it. Yeah, I think you do get better. I saw uh, a veteran last night. Uh, you know Felicia Michaels. She, uh, I remember seeing her on TV when I was in high school. I told her that too. Super funny, and, um, and uh, she's like a hot mom, you know. Yeah. And uh, now her boy, her two boys in uh, college. And uh, she talks about, she goes, she just has so much swag and experience, you could tell. And she's just like, yeah, I got two boys, you know? And she goes, fuck those guys, man. <laughs> just fuck them. And then she, that's her, like, just goes right into it of why, you know, you could tell she loves her sons, but mm -hmm. how, you know? And she told me on the side too, she's like, I stopped standing for nine years. Nine years. Raising them. And she, and she goes, I was bitter. I was angry. Wow. And, so uh, wow. and I go, wow. And I go, it's so good you're back. She goes, yeah. But she has so much confidence. Mm. So like as you're saying, you can only get better. It really uh, helped me. Like I appreciated that she told me that. Because even I consider this my nine years. You know, I'm doing, I'm raising kids. But I'm not like completely, I don't want to give up. You know, I'm, not, I'm gonna, I, I have to keep, keep it moving, man. And I love it, dude. Thank mm. you coming for, to coming to my birthday show. Like you could tell, right? I was just having so much fun. Dude. Oh, you were. I was just you were so funny. Your jokes. Thank you, man. Oh I was, but I, it was mostly because I think people could tell, like, dude, this is my birthday. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? I got a day job, but this is my clubbing. This is my party. Like, mm -hmm. thank you. And and they named the show Collaboration Laugh Factory. Jamie Masada, the owner, dude, I've known him for 15 years. We've had yelling arguments. He's yelled at me. He's like made me cry basically. Like there's times when like they're actually me and him, we got a big fight. One time I left the Laugh Factory and then came back. You know what I'm saying? We've had our own little drama. And now we're like, I feel like, you know, almost like father-son type of like uncle relationship. And mm. you know, after the pandemic, I was like, I asked them, you know him and Mika, thank you, Mika, his, his uh, awesome wife, uh, who I've known for a long time at Laugh Factory too. I was like, can we name this collaboration? It's a community event, talent show. And I think in the past, they probably would have been like, wait, what? Like, what's collab, you know? No, it's Asian. They used to call it Asian Invasion. I hated it. <laughs> I, I, ch I made them change to Asian Night. It took me years to like, can we just make it Asian Night? And, uh, you know, they're like, sure. Like we'll, we'll do, call it collaboration. So for me, it's like, I'm in this other phase of my life. Mm. I'm not where I want to be, but this, my baby, this Asian talent show that I started when I was 23 and I was 21, 22 years old now, that name is going to be on the marquee on Sunset Boulevard where tens of thousands of cars drive through all the time. Um, and people are going to see that name. I like, I'm proud of that, man. Like I, I, that our collaboration talent show has helped provide a stage for thousands of Asian American artists across the country, across 14 cities so that tens of thousands of people could see them live and millions have seen the YouTube videos. Like, so if you keep pushing forward, it's like, it's not, sometimes it's not where you want to be, mm -hmm. but like, you know, God takes you on these other 
this other direction where it's you're not moving this way you're moving this way this way but you're still moving forward man and it's like it's uh it's exciting i didn't know i mean that that's a big deal though you know now i'm i'm so excited about and it's a that. regular show it's every 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 first friday first friday 7 30. it's a tough time man hollywood 7 30 uh-huh. to get people to go there the only reason that one was like mostly packed was this july 4th weekend mm-hmm. i already know like it's going to be probably like half full or whatever but whatever right like i'm gonna just keep pushing the show and uh i'm really proud that i've been doing asian night laugh factory for for 14 years now and i've helped put i've helped bring literally over ten thousand people to the laugh factory over those 14 years like just promoting just getting a lot of a lot of asian people said it was their first time ever seeing a live comedy show and they all had a good time like you know they like they don't know what to expect and they all you just they just you could just feel this like natural high and a sense of community it wasn't all asian people of course there's a lot of non-asian people some of them that don't even know is asian ideas show up but uh but then there's a sense of community when you have asians from all different parts of southern california or they're visiting from out of state and we're there that night talking about our culture and for some of them they've never had that in their life they're the only asian in their neighborhood or their city and they feel like oh wow like it was like a moment for them you know like yeah i'm they're asian american or they're asian canadian or they're wherever they're from from a different country they felt this like wow this is like a really cool community at church you always have to say the right thing but here no we keep it way more real you know Mm -hmm. about you know sex drugs whatever things you can't really talk about but it's real you know it's things we should be talking about in our asian community you know everything's swept under the rug but it's important because i remember last time we were talking um uh, it was oh oh, so um you were you, you you also you were tired it was like a while ago but you you felt um, like like you said a few times, like maybe you weren't exactly where you've envisioned where you would want to be. Just like a lot of us, we we think we would be somewhere by wherever. But but uh, what I said last time that now I could say it on here is that by you putting on these shows, you being there, you being one of the first like Asian Americans, Korean Americans that influenced the next generation, including myself. And the crazy thing is like now me, and I'm not even that deep into it like people my age are starting to influence the next generation because they've, they've told me that which is a strange thing because I'm, I'm still like fucking I'm, I'm not like there you know exactly like skill wise and all that stuff too but that but but you Margaret Cho Bobby Lee started Gee, this don't, don't put me on the same line as Margaret Cho Bobby Lee Margaret Cho is the yeah. pioneer Margaret yeah. Cho Henry Cho Bobby Lee I mean there's a whole group of them but yeah. for for me and if you just look at history and Google it and where she started, Margaret Cho is the pioneer of Asian American stand-up comedy. And she, as a female, was you, you, it was even did, harder to She too, started right? before she was 18. When I yeah. bring her up on stage, I say 18 because I don't want to say like, she started when she was 17. It might have been 16, 17 because mm-hmm. people get all like weird about it. She was like going around comedy, cl- you know, at under 18, not drinking, but just doing time. Like if you think about it, man, like I think about like, my daughter would I let her like you know but her parents the way they s- provided for the family had a, a bookstore that also so- sold like adult things you know at their bookstore oh yeah in San Francisco you know and some of it was like gay porn too right and so mm-hmm. she grew up so like open-minded and that's why she her and um her brother Han who I know they're they're just so much more open-minded but she got judged especially by the conservative Korean Christian community saying she's like a sellout for making fun of her mom. She's talking about her mom unfairly, man. She got persecuted almost and she just got blacklisted by a lot of Koreans, you know? Um, but she is the pioneer, man. A Margaret Cho, a mad respect to her, mad respect to you. Henry Cho doing it, uh, you know, in Tennessee where his, one of his specials was, all white people in him and he's mad cool he's replied to me on email too i've always tried to like open for him but he's really cool bobby lee 
Matt, big time pioneer Joe Coy. Like there's Joe so Coy. many, man, like these guys have been grinding for so long and, uh, they're the Roger Bannister of Asian American comedy. And like, you know, Roger Bannister in like, uh, London, like long time ago, nobody could break the four minute mile, uh, like in history and then this guy in london roger bannister ran it in four minutes and after him all these people started running in four minutes which showed it wasn't a physical barrier it was like a a mental barrier people thought like oh it's impossible and then since then like hundreds of people <laughs> have have run the four minute mile in in less than four minutes it's like once people saw margaret then people were like well I, i'm an asian girl i can do it too and when people see you they're like yeah i i he i can you know resonate with him so you make an impact. Mm. All of us are, but like if you look at like the hip hop pioneers, you know, and uh, a lot of them don't get their due respect. Man, I I just Margaret, Henry, Bobby. I know there's a lot more too. Joe Coy, uh, Russell Peters been in the game along too. Like they've been grinding for so long. It's like they should get their respect. They're uh, yeah. I'm so thankful to them then they created that path it makes it a little easier and then now it's like watch out man like before man when i first started it was like you knew all the asian american comedians like there were like 30 of us you know there was like a competition once and like we all showed up once <laughs> you know and then it was like uh yeah joey gila dan gary like there's like a lot of people and then edwin san juan rex neverette amy anderson all oh, rex neverette is an og yeah. like and then there was like 30 and then there was like 40 and there was like 50 dude, that, dude there's like a thousand now and now watch the next generation there's going to be like five thousand you know what i'm saying like yeah. you know what i'm saying like my kids generate there's gonna be five thousand there's gonna be so many and it's just gonna raise the level uh and there's also gonna be a lot of bad ones so a lot yeah yeah so it's gonna be <laughs> but it's gonna you know it's gonna overall hopefully cream rises to the top it's gonna raise the level of comedy yeah no I, I, I agree in that um yeah i was curious about this so at what point did you feel like you found your voice in comedy we had confidence in it i can I be honest with you man i yeah. i really feel like i recently found it i've been you know they say 10 years a lot mm -hmm. of people I, they, you know you usually find your voice 10 years since I only went up once a week, a lot of times, I guess, uh, like like I said, I'm not actually a real 15 year. It's more like right now, dude. Like the pandemic really made me see like, man, a lot of people, and I, I respect for you for speaking on this a lot in your videos, is no one's going to look out for Asians, man, in America and, and in Australia and in Canada. Like, and a lot of people that are silent, like, most of them are just busy or whatever, or they don't even know enough about it, or they just, they're going about their lives. They don't want to think about that. But some of them are, have, have seen these videos on all the IGs. And I know that they secretly probably like that they're racist themselves. They're not speaking up because they like that someone else is beating up on Asians because these dirty Asians are the ones that brought this virus over to us and they're the ones and i know an asian in my neighborhood that's rude to me at the store and the asians are so exclusive and they don't want to assimilate or talk to us so whatever like they don't deserve my and this is another bullshit movement stop asian the silence is so loud man the silence is so loud so i just am is at to a point where and 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 there's most of the white people black people latino people middle eastern i i think they do care and they're cool they just don't care enough to really speak up but some of them i think they're just purposely just quiet because deep inside they're like yeah man chase these dirty motherfuckers out of the country man yeah you just people in general right that, that, like a, there's a minority it. of people i don't think it's the majority there's a minority yeah, I, mean, I mean in general i don't mean i'm saying um just to clarify you're not talking about a specific group of people you're just saying like there's pockets of every type of person that of every are, are culture of every culture exactly yeah of that's every what i meant culture yeah not a specific one and so for me what i can do I, with my day job and my kids and work emceeing weddings and stand, is like just at least talk about it and mm -hmm. repost things like for me that's it but it's like a lot of people don't even want to talk about it or repost something why like why I, 
I got in an argument with my wife about it. I'm like, I know you're busy, but can you can't just repost something? So finally she did, but I could tell she was like more annoying. Like not everybody is like, you know, you can't expect everybody to be like, I'm like, I understand. And plus she's busy as fuck. Like she's working more than anybody. So a lot of people are like that too. Some people can't because they're, their work and they're like, oh, you're getting all social, you know, justice warrior on it, like whatever. But this isn't about that. This is elderly people getting punched stabbed kicked murdered Mm -hmm. and people are just quiet or jaded about it and so it's like it just got to a point where i'm like my voice i'm just gonna say whatever i want and it's like i the truth has come out man especially with all the maga people the true colors have just come out everywhere, you know, through the pandemic and through Trump. It's like, <laughs> yeah, man. I'm, it's like, uh, I just, you, you just see so much bullshit. You're just like, all right, you know, at least I try to keep it real. And so through my comedy on stage, at least I know in my heart, like at least I try to keep it real. So, I'm just going to I'm just going to speak from my heart and and speak it loud, you know. Like I recently recently it just got to that point where like I also know like yeah, like I'm also getting older and life is short. I could die any moment too. I don't want to like leave the earth without seeing what I really feel. My only thing that's holding me back 100% is I'm a recruiter for a co- uh, for a company, a large company, you know. It's like they watch. Mm. So I can't really like and plus, I work with mostly white people that are like super nice. I love them. I'm not just saying this. The team I'm at is like best team I've ever had. I don't see myself leaving this company. I love my boss. How rare is that? Very Mo- rare. Most people are like, yeah. F this job. Like, I want to leave. Um, I, I love my boss. He's a really good dude. I could feel like that. I could I could say after a few years, like, humble dude. And he's like all about his family. Hardworking. And, uh Yeah it's it's just not it's just more about like sometimes you really want to say something but then you think about like okay but then i don't want to endanger my family and like my kids need to eat you know what i'm saying a bit like there's that that's a hindrance to that's why you, like they say you want to make enough money where you have fuck it money like you know fuck you money yeah it's like i'm trying to get there i'm so far <laughs> i was working i'm trying to figure out what side hustle can i do because it's not weddings i'm like that's a that's like a side hustle but that's not gonna get me rich I, i'm trying to figure out some online you know legal business that's gonna um help me get enough money where i can just not work that day job and just focus on comedy and say whatever Sorry. the fuck you want to say yes at the same time too right exactly and that's why yeah. you see the the uh big comedians like andrew schultz who I don't always like, but like Joe Rogan, who I don't always don't like either. But you understand, like they could say whatever. He Joe Rogan curses in his ads. He's one of the only. <laughs> he's like fucking stamps.com, motherfucking stamps.com. I used to. Li- he's one of the only people I would listen to all of his ads. Have you listened to all his ads before the podcast? Not all of them, but I've listened to a good amount. You listen of them. to him, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, like where he's just like talking about. You know what I'm saying? Um, whatever company and he calls it the motherfucker like you have so much fuck you money and then on top of that they gave him another hundred million dollars of fuck you money that's insane so it's like because he just doesn't give a fuck and people want that authentic real version instead of like ha huh, you know what well, stop hub or whatever right but he's like motherfucking stub you know what I'm saying <laughs> like he says it like when you get to that point man it's like I, even though I hate some of the guests Joe Rogan brings on and some of the little, uh, you know, he borderline supports Trump sometimes. Like, I respect his hustle and the fact that he can curse while doing his commercials. Mm. He is on that top 1%. You know what I'm saying? They don't let everybody do that. I even listen to All the Smoke. It's Matt Barnes and um, Stephen Jackson's NBA podcast and they're blazing during their podcast oh yeah they do yeah i've seen that yeah. but even their ads they do it straight no cursing they have to do it like corporate like joe rogan's on another level where he's like yeah i'll i'll, I'll do your ad but i'm gonna do it however the fuck i want and then they're like please 
do it for us you know they're begging him it's like that's crazy man that's the money where it's like you could say whatever you want and it's like i'm so far from that but at least i know that compared to most of the people that are at their day job and hate their life mm -hmm. at least i know that um I have an outlet and a and a dream I'm I'm going for where most people don't. That's why they're miserable, man. Mm -hmm. They wake up so miserable. I wake up miserable, but at least I know like. But after my work, I'm gonna work on some other, you know, other things like towards what I love to do. Some people are, they're just so lost and they don't know. They never really had like a passion for anything, you know, other than like I'm not hating on this, you know, but like let's say cars right fine it's it, it, it's something but it's ultimate okay that's a bad example because maybe it, some people are so good with cars that it makes them a lot of money more than me so that's like, a bad uh, watching but, netflix yeah yeah all day something that doesn't really ultimately it's gonna it's not gonna make your life any better mm. you know they don't have that um and sometimes it's not their fault they just don't they haven't found it. Yeah. I wish you, I wish we could help them find it. You know, like for some people, once they find it, their whole life transforms. Like some, I've seen like high school kids that used to be like straight up gangsters, and I meet run into them later in life, and they just found it. They found something, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you could just totally see like it's just you know transform their life like. You know whatever it was yeah because at that point you feel more in control of your destiny you don't feel helpless so then you don't feel like you have to act out and cause mayhem and destruction by imploding and then just putting that out explosion out into the world and destroying shit you know i know some ex uh gangster youngs that found surfing they just you know mellowed them wow. out surfing surfing mellowed them out ex gangster youngs that like jujitsu of course Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, and then they, uh, you, you know, they get you get so obsessed into it, and then it calms them down because you know, now they're not looking for fights. Now they know like, they're confident. You could just tell, you know, like no one's messing with me because uh, they, they already know that. By the way, I'm gonna put my my uh, my boys in jujitsu for sure. Yeah, you could just feel I'm, all my friends at jujitsu. Do you do you do MMA or no? No, I I I wanted to, but I have this like medical condition to where um i have a greater chance to get a retinal detachment oh, if shoot. i get hit in the head yeah keep your keep yeah because I, I mean i did wrestling in high school and then i did do boxing in college for a bit but then the eye, two eye doctors were like yeah don't do it don't yeah because I, I i'm also glad i haven't because then it helps me with what i want to do so i can think a little bit more clearly but um i i, I would like to do you know just maybe just try muay thai without the sparring or something because i just want to i just want to like get active and like just fuck something up, you know, like a bag or something. I don't have to. Before I wanted to just like hurt people for like ego purposes to prove something to myself, but it doesn't. I would. I probably wouldn't even feel that good you even if rage. I did. Huh? You had rage. Did I have rage? Yeah. Oh hell yeah! The worst temper. It was. It was the worst, and I, I really got way better. Like way better. Like fucking on. Like I'm a completely different person. Um, the friends that know me, they know that, but. We're Korean, so I think we all. It comes out in its own little way, whether on stage or just like, like, oh, you, oh, you, you, you want me to fucking lose? You, you, you think I'm a fucking afraid of you? You know. Yeah, that's why I'm telling you, uh, this mastermind thing, dude. I, I really hope whoever's listening, um, even if in your twenties, like, it's a mature thing to do. Like, it, you know, in your 20s, guys might feel like, oh, that's corny. Like, we're going to have like a group thing and it's going to be scheduled. Yeah. It's going to, it's like one of the most important things you could do, man. Like, I can't explain like how much it helps us. We get together and every single time we just open up about what we did. What, what's your day like? It like, um, you just, yeah, mental, it helps your mental health a lot, man. I encourage anybody listening to this. I've been telling this to so many people, but I don't know. I haven't heard one person yet tell me like, hey, I started one because of you. So I just keep talking about it because I'm waiting for that one person to be like, hey, man, I started one uh, in, my, in my hood because of you. I heard you talk about it, you know. 
I think a lot of guys have too much pride to call, tell their friends like, or email, hey man, like, let's do this mastermind thing where we like get together and we schedule and we like, you know, open up, open up. That's what they're scared of. We talk about our feelings, whatever. <laughs> yeah, motherfucker. So you don't become suicidal and you don't like, you know, hurt other people and hurt yourself. That's, it's like, you're going to have so much pride that you, like, you're going to go through your whole life just fucking punching walls and punching your wife and punching your kids and you know what I'm saying starting fights at bars just because you have so much pride that you can't be like hey man you want to start this mastermind group thing I heard about it like I heard you know because that's scarier to do being uh, vulnerable and showing that type of emotional rawness than than to act out in these like really fucking violent ways you know and I, I've I did try to do hey, what do you that. think about it it's so dumb it's so stupid. It's dumb. I used to punch him. Every time I punched the pole, I was like, do you really want to punch this pole? Or is this like an act? It was like almost like a performative. No, but when, it, when you put it that way, what I'm yeah. saying is like, would you rather write this email that you feel a little dumb, but but if if once you get it going, yeah. we have the best time, dude. Me and my boys, we have, <laughs> we have the best time. We, afterwards, we always like, sometimes go to Cafe Blue or we like, we just kick it. And we have the best time, right? And it's like all the wives know and they love it because... They know we're not like, they know where we are yeah. and they know we're like just talking about like, like how to make our life better, mm -hmm. how to be better husbands. So they love it. And so, and we take the families too. We're like doing this, like a family trip thing, all the wives and kids together. Like how fun is that? Right. Either that or would I rather punch walls and rage out. Right. And when you put it that way. <laughs> Still, most guys would be like, "Nah, I'd rather do this one. <laughs> I'd rather yeah. punch walls. This is more familiar. Yeah, <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather uh, make my life worse and just, you know, because it's pride, dude. Pride is like a killer, man. Com comedy helps a lot to strip that pride, you know, because yeah. you can't help bombing sometimes, and that hurts. But then it makes you feel like it wasn't that bad. Like, uh, like okay, that that hurts, but." But then getting the laugh feels amazing. So I, I, yeah, I want to get through this pain to get to that next laugh, you know? So I think that, I think that comedy helps a lot of people that don't have comedy, man, they're like the ones that always try to bust your balls, but they don't know how to, but they go too deep. You know what I'm saying? You know, some guys are like that. They should, they just say some comment, but it's like really like a little too, uh, like I'm saying, like, like, uh, if I'm setting up for a wedding and, Oh, I thought you'd be bigger by now. You know, like that. Yeah. I'm just busting your balls, man. Come on. But and then yeah. they say something else again later. You know. Oh, 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 you still don't have a girlfriend, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, because you're not. Oh, you're not making money, or you're not famous. I thought you were famous. You're so funny, though. You're so funny. What yeah, happened? Yeah, yeah. It's it's not a real compliment. I Little fucking thing. hate that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, you you drive your minivan? Is this your is this your car? Oh, yeah. I understand, man. I I used to have one. You know, see, like there's a little, like little jabs. I, I had this guy where I saw him at a bar. He was fucking shit faced, and he saw me before I started doing this. So he's been watching me, and then he just came up. I don't know. I haven't seen him for like a while, but he's been watching me. He's like, if he's fucking shit faced. He's like, he's like, bro, dude, TikTok famous guy here. TikTok famous guy here. Yeah, how much you make, bro? I know you make a lot of money. How much you make? Come on, on TikTok, dude, you're famous. You you have to be making a lot of money. Right, you have to be. He was shit face talking like that, and I was like, he was being really aggressive. It, uh, and I was like, hey, I'm like, you need to chill out a little bit. Like, it doesn't matter. It's not. It's not really anything. He said, no, you're lying. I know you're lying. Come on, you have to be. You have to be. It was fucking weird. That's interesting. It was like he was uh, kind of complimenting you, but he was also being weird, like uh, trying to be like. Net, weird network like a forced networking like hey man if you're blowing up remember me man oh shit no he did say that he said uh, um he was like he was like dude he's like you know i always believed in you right <laughs> out of nowhere <laughs> I've, I've only seen him at the gym i've always believed in you dude, I've only seen him at it's the gym. A, he's like Let he's like a times. um there's like, like fame times. leeches yeah fame leeches like they're just in case you keep they want to let you know, like, hey, man, I'm a part of this. I'm a part of this. I always believed in you. <laughs> yeah, and then I, I'm like... Did you ever know, know that you were my hero? He just starts singing it. Fly, fly, high. Fly, fly, 
would have lied to the sky. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. So he did that. And then, um, yeah, it was very... Very aggressive, very weird. No, like, but you like, said that he came, he was like, uh, "Did you know I I always believed in yeah, you?" Yeah, he said, "You know I always believed in you, right?" And he kept like, he kept fucking bumping his chest into me, and I because he's like five five, but really buff, and I'm five eleven, so I, I was like about to fall over, and I had to push him away. I'm like, dude, chill out. I had to keep pushing him away, but he was like, he was like, p- fucking throwing himself onto me, like, you know that, right? You fuck, you know, you know, I've always believed in you. Right? Don't forget me when you're famous. Do you know how many people told me don't forget me when you're famous? You know why? I fucking hate that well, shit. Well, it's because they feel... Um, well, there's jealousy. Agreed. I actually understand when people say that. There's jealousy and there's like that feeling of like... Uh, they want to be a part of it, man. They want to be a part of it. But it's like the wrong way. It's just like you shouldn't say that to people because that doesn't make them want you to be a part of it. Dude, it's they're, like they're not even there. They weren't like, even there the whole time. That's what I'm saying. They're just fame leeches. <laughs> yeah, they want to be leeches. there at the end. They, uh, they check in once in a while and then they respond to your story with a with a clap emoji. Worst thing, it's like if you really want to be a part of it, you could be like, hey, uh, is there anything I, anything I could do to help? I remember Joe Coy a long time ago, you know, he would do uh, Ice House and then um, there were these... Uh, there was like a, a couple, I remember, and like another dude, they were selling his merch outside. I mean, this is when he's grinding, right? I mean, he's known, but not like rock star Joe Coy, right? And then we all went to go eat at like this 24-hour spot. It's like a Denny's kind of spot in, at Pasadena. So I was, I was getting to know them. And then I was like, oh, how'd you meet them? And then they're like, oh, yeah, I met them after the shows. And then they just were like good people, first of all. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, people that you'd actually want to kick it with. And then they were like, can we help? Like, what can we do to help? So they helped run his merch, right? And then he trusts them. This is like, you know, before his sister was running. And so like, that's the best way. If you really believe in that, like, hey, remember when you're famous, like you're not doing anything. Like if you really believe in that, you'd be like, hey, what can I do to help you? And then now, now we're eating together at this 24 hour spot. Now they're like friends with Joe Coy, like because they put the work in mm-hmm. and they genuinely believe in him. So when he does blow up, they're like, yeah, I remember. They, like, helped me feed my son. Like, so the whole, like, it's, yeah, it's lazy when I think about it. Like, they're just trying to fame leech and, like, remember me when you're famous. And you're like, no, I won't. (laughs) It's like, dude, I fucking forgot about you the whole fucking two years because you haven't talked to me at all that's so funny or go to my shows at least you're getting it though because you are blowing up on tiktok you have been and uh i uh i haven't gotten a remember me in your fame i want to start getting those i want to start blowing up. when i first oh. started before before youtube yeah. was i had a little window where i felt like uh like a like a eight like the way ryan higa and you know like yeah. they were because i had some songs that people were forwarding it to each other's email attachments dude and I was getting all these college shows and it was going everywhere. I mean, it went so far that when I was dating Tammy, my wife, the second day, she was like, do you know the song? It costs a lot to be Opa, right? I'm like, yeah, that was my song. She goes, that's you? That helped my sex life a lot. You know? <laughs> she was like, what? She goes, that's so funny. My girls and I, we all love that sound. We forward to each other everywhere. So there was a little window. And then I remember people were saying like, remember me when you're famous? And so um, it's a good thing mostly, but it's also annoying if they're like, you're like, we never even hung out or talked, dude. What are you talking about? If someone actually, you could tell like they're cool and you know, you hung out, you talk before they say it, then it's like, okay. They're, they're more like, don't leave me behind, you know? Yeah, but at the same time, it just reminds me of the guy who was, hey, I have cancer. Can you send me things? Not that far. Okay, that's not that much. far, not that no, far. No, that's but, what I'm but, saying. It's because they know certain you. Ones, but they certain, know you. But the ones that don't know me, that well, or they see me the ones like, that don't a few know times, and no, we're not even the, friends the, the like that. The ones that you don't know, yeah, they don't fuck them. But yeah, <laughs> this fucking cancer guy, you're like, he sent me one too. <laughs> You've been caught. Oh my god, <laughs> you're not passing away anytime oh soon. Oh my god, you fucking liar. What's that one to, to catch a predator? What does he say? There's a line. Oh, oh, the uh, uh. that guy. He he goes. Uh, where do you think you're going? He's like, have a seat here. You know, he always tells them, have a seat here. And they're like, oh. and they're still eating the the cookies <laughs> or the, the pizza, trying to play it cool. Like, hey man, what's up, dude? It's like, uh, you're you're here. Um, 
So we have a transcript of what you you said. Uh, I want to go. stick my <laughs> beep beep in your beep and then lick your beep. Um, did you say this? <laughs> he takes a, takes a bite of the chocolate chip cookie. No, no, I didn't say that. It's like uh, we we have it right here. And you know they're thinking they're like. How am I gonna run? And then they see the big camera, right? That oh, they big all come cam- out. No, and then they know that it makes me look suspicious, so they just stay there. They yeah. just sit. They're like, "Oh shit, you've been caught, bro!" Sending messages to every comedian. You fucked up. Oh man, but uh, how to catch a cancer patient? How to catch a, a, <laughs> a fake, fake cancer. a fake cancer patient <laughs> wanting comedians merch? Oh my god, dude, that's hilarious, dude. It's the fucking most random thing. Jesus Christ. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's off my head now. I don't have to. I don't, I'm not. No guilt whatsoever now. Especially after that. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. But you know what's going to happen though, right? Because like collaboration is going to keep growing. And then I know, I, I, I know for a fact that um, I don't want to like jinx anything, but things are progressing. Yeah. That's all I'm gonna say. It's just it's gonna keep it's just gonna keep no, going that it. way. Like a hundred, like I, I, feel, I fucking it. feel it a thousand percent. I feel it. Fucking I, a thousand percent. I see it, and uh, I I mean I really hated that this pandemic happened. And rest in peace to everybody who died. But it it really did bring a lot of true colors um, to light. And so uh, for me, I just I'm just gonna have a much a louder voice, mm-hmm. just because uh, you know. All the things I've seen. I mean, I know we talked about this. Like, time has passed now. I don't, I don't want to rehash too much, you know. But uh, and I don't. I don't know Peng Dang. I never met him before. We connected on social media after the whole incident went down in Austin. I've always thought Tony Hinchcliffe was a uh, amazing roast comedian. Mm-hmm. Like just watching him, Comedy Central. I've heard him on Joe Rogan. I never met him in person, but I've met like the whole other crew, right? Like Brian Redband, I met Joe Rogan and uh, Jeremiah Watkins, who I love, you know, like that whole like Kill Tony, right? Like there's, I think they're amazing, right? They're all amazing. But like, I don't know. It doesn't sit well to me. He's never apologized for the fact that like, he called him a dirty, filthy little chink. And then uh, with a hacky Asian joke afterward, like some of his caliber, that was like mm. such a fail, right? Um, the hacky joke was offensive. That was because it was so bad for some of Tony's stature. Uh, the fact that I heard he had a bodyguard, he can't walk around the bodyguard so he could roast people, but then his bodyguard protects. What's that all about? <laughs> What's that all about? Um, and uh, I know Joe Rogan canceled him on some of his things. And, you know, I genuinely do feel bad. He got, I think it canceled by his agency. But then he gained 5,000 followers after that on his Instagram. What's that all about? Um, I just, I just, uh, if Stephen A. Smith apologized for saying, like, the face of base, baseball, uh, sh- you know, should learn to speak English. And then he, all the, you know, people, yeah. like, went after him and then he apologized probably because ESPN's like, you better apologize, right? He said it's not ESPN, but whatever. Whatever's going to hurt his money. I bet he was like, you know, that's my guess. So he apologized, right? But props to him for apologizing, at least acknowledging it. Tony Hinchcliffe, he's one of those guys that like, and I've I've known people like this, they never know how to say sorry, man to man. Um, maybe Peng shouldn't have released it that way, but then we'll never, we've, we would have never have known, right? It's like, people hate this example. I'm just going to use this one last time here on your podcast because I've done it in comments and you know, a few people are like, why do you have to use that example? It's just like he would never, after a black comedian, have said, give it up for that dirty, filthy little N-word. Mm-hmm. Ever. So why are people so like, upset that there was backlash? Because we're fucking human beings that have pride in our culture and our parents and everything they've sacrificed to give us a better life here in this country, our grandparents and the first Asian Americans that came over as virtual slaves to building the railroad so that America could become a world, more wealthy nation. And some of them were killed and called chink, mm-hmm. a racial slur. And all the, I've seen some videos where like people are like, I didn't know that was a bad, you didn't know chink was a, 
a bad word, a racial slur. Fuck you, you fucking liar. You're a liar. It's like, for you to not think that that's not going to be offensive to hurt people when Asian elderly and grandparents are getting punched in the face, stabbed, murdered, killed, and just calling, hey, give it up for that dirty, filthy little chink here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What are you doing? Just... You know, he's always going to be a great Rose comedian. It's just my level of respect just like dropped considerably. And then uh, the fact that he never apologizes like dropped even more. So I just, you know, I haven't even really talked about it just like in some comments or whatever, social media. But I just, I'm just like, you know, just the, just the way people shit on Asians, mostly because we're 6% of the country, we're too quiet, we don't talk back. Our parents told us, keep your head down, don't make a lot of trouble, just work hard, make money. But like, no, the next generation of Asians are louder now and we we will speak up, you know, like Daniel Day Kim speaking straight to Congress. He's the man, dude. Like he, you know, he's just telling us, like telling it how it is. And I think that you've been doing it on your TikTok. More people need to do that and uh, and speak up. People always take advantage of those who they think they can take advantage of They because they want to bully them and they they know that they're quiet and they won't speak up and all these comedians that were like more mad about the fact that Peng put that video up than the fact that he was called a chink if he said that to a black comedian and used the n-word all those comedians would be like oh well Tony come on how could you he went too far mm-hmm. because black people speak up black people they rise up they speak up you know and it's a totally different struggle with black people have had with Asians. Black people have it a lot worse in America, you know, and for a lot longer, Native Americans have had the worst and black people. So yes, it's a whole different, and black people have had it worse, way worse. But that doesn't take it away that it still hurts Asians when he says that. It doesn't take away like, it's just a joke, okay. Uh, if you saw, you know, people of your heritage, your culture, your ethnicity, your parents that look like your parents and your grandparents, every day on Instagram, they we're looking at it all the time. Jackfruit, Asians never die, next chart, Asians with attitudes. I'm just throwing out a few of them, right? Like mm-hmm. there's a hundred Asian IGs documenting all these now. Thank God. Thank God for the Asian IGs archiving all of them because without them, people would be like, oh, where, where, when does this happen? I don't, I don't see it. When did it happen? It's like, they just took like an hour and just really saw what's going on. It's like, uh, you know, I think people would have a, most people, I think they would, they would uh, feel, this is really messed up what's going on, man. So when you're saying like, things are progressing, yeah, and for me, it's like, it's a double-edged sword. It's like comedy, mm-hmm. collaboration. Um, and for me, that's 90%. It's the positive, positivity, bringing Asians together. But just as a human being, yeah, the other 10%, the other part of the sword is also like just letting people know like, hey, we're Americans too, man. Like we're human beings too. Like are you, nobody's going to speak about this. Mm-hmm. No one's going to speak up for it. I'm down for Black Lives Matter all the way. Like, I'm down to, for all the the causes that are affecting the Latino community and the Middle Eastern community. You know what I'm saying? Native, Native Americans and white people that feel like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're outcasted too. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure there's, that I want to like, have a conversation too. Like, I've grown up with mostly white, white people who are like mad cool, you know? So it's like, I don't like using the whole, yes white supremacy is a real thing systematic oppression is a real thing i don't like talking about that a lot about bringing up things when i don't know enough i know it's a real thing but for me it's more like can we have conversations about is anybody going to talk about like hey man like there really is like asian elderly people getting attacked daily it's crazy man 
It's crazy. Yeah, it's a. But I see what you mean about the whole like the double edged sword of this whole thing in in, in a way. But um, but the good news is it 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 did have an effect of where Asians are fucking like really like rising up because they're they're like I'm fucking sick of this shit. Yeah. Like I'm fucking sick of this shit type I, thing. And no one, no one. There, you see the uh, the few allies and mm-hmm. thank you every time I saw one. Like in terms of like, I would post to like uh, Dwayne Wade, Damian Lillard, uh, Rihanna. P- yeah, it's a, it's a small gesture, but it means so much. Mm-hmm. Just wearing a shirt, stop Asian hair, or Dwayne Wade talking about like all people want is just peace. We we need to like talk about these things. Rihanna showing up to dude. I was always a Rihanna fan, like kind of right. Like her songs were always on. She has like so many hits. But after she did that, man, I was bumping Rihanna like in my car, <laughs> singing the most girly song. Going like, back to the old like I'm the my- only girl in the world. I'm like Rihanna. <laughs> under my umbrella. Ella, Ella. That, that first like, breakout dude, song. Because she got some backlash too from uh, some people in the black community. Like, yeah. oh man, she's a sell. It's like, come on, man. If if there's conflict between like an Asian store owner and someone, that's between those two people directly that should be verbal never physical that doesn't mean like if you have that conflict you're if they're mad that okay i, I understand the anger like these people are rude maybe they come off racist some of them taking money from our neighborhood that's a legitimate reason to be angry right but this mean like people can just go down the street some of them weren't muggings or they were just punching people in the face I, I can't imagine if someone did to my mom, like the rage hmm. I would feel like I couldn't live life again the same. Like my life would completely be obsessed about, I need, we need to st- stop people from doing this. Like my mom just got punched, attacked. In, my mom, like she's the nicest, sweetest, kindest person I've ever known in my life. Like, and it's because they're always viewed as the other. They don't speak English or they don't, you know, they're not they're not even three dimensional like they're just two dimensional people like it's like the invisible people in yeah and they're not gonna they don't have a voice so they can't report us to the like you know and they're just these dirty people that bring the virus over so just <clears throat> that um all that man it's like channeling all that you know part of that's gonna come back out through the microphone loud to the stage. I've already been talking about Laugh Factory Long Beach. I did two sets. Uh, you know, I, I talked about how like, you know, just being Asian American and, and feeling the glares. I felt the glares, man. I definitely felt like where I had to check one of my neighbors to feel, am I tripping? Mm-hmm. And he gave me the glare multiple times. I really want to talk to him. I actually like dropped off gifts to my neighbors just to be like, hey man, like I'm all love your it's like uh and then do it in the trash <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I found it in, i probably i don't know i found it in his trash no. it's like when, you, when you're barking you're putting out flyers oh, oh i'll check out the show and they just fucking yeah, toss it i know they should just give it back to you and, you and you find a gingerbread trail of sadness <laughs> and only one person came to the show after you gave out you like a hundred flyers just talking to fucking that's so funny a gingerbread trail of sadness i've done that i've 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 passed out flyers before and found it gingerbread tree i'm like you could have just given back to me that's why i always give back to him if i don't want to you know save it no thank you yeah because otherwise you know but there's an art form to it like when they're walking fast you put it right in their chest because when you put it in their chest then they have to grab it dude i had somebody doing that to me while i was jogging yeah yeah, right he like put into my chest with the momentum of his arms flinging outward but at the same time i'm running into his hand so i'm like oh and i was like so i just put it in my pocket yeah that's the, you gotta put in their chest put around their hand you know yeah and i folded it and i and then i ran uh, about a quarter more of a mile until and i was out of his way and i threw it in the trash can <laughs> yeah into one where he wouldn't see it because i'm nice i'm a nice fucking guy there you go that you is the, that is the best way to do it. it's like ladies if you're if you're uh if you're getting proposed to in public you know sometimes they say no in front of everybody what why just say yeah and then 
later. <laughs> I mean, like, dude. That's true, huh? Just take you, him to the side, be like, hey, that was a little. Or just like, hey, can we talk about this over dinner? And then like, yeah. like, let's go over this all like, whoa, like I'm in my head or whatever. But like, just to be like, no, like sometimes they're in a baseball stadium, you know, you're like. Oh, with the TVs, like, national. Damn, dude. Oh my God. Like, it, it would have been okay if you just said, yeah. And then like, hey, can we talk about this? You know what I'm That's saying? the biggest fucking flex. What? Turning down a man in front of everybody or anybody, whoever's proposing in front of every fucking person there. Like you have to be so cold hearted. And you know, what's crazy about that too is like, you know, you're, you're dating, right? You're going on dates, you're hanging out, mm-hmm. you know, probably having sex. Right. And then when she does that, that relationship's done. Like it's not, it's not like you're like, Oh, well, if she says no publicly in front of like 60,000 people and on TV, millions of people, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's saying like, there's no, fu- I don't see any future in this. So it's like, it, all of a sudden it's like, uh, boom, you know, period. Yeah. Crash the wall. Done. Yeah. Printed out paper. There is no hope for the rest of this essay. It's fucking done. Done. Yeah. So anyways, um, PK, thank you so much for being here. You know, I appreciate you because you have a show right after this too as well. Um, but before you go, would you like to plug in your social medias? Yeah, at PK Comedy on Instagram. That's pretty much it. If you can follow me there, thank you. At PK Comedy. PK Comedy. Guys, thank you for listening. This has been another episode of the Set Breaker Podcast. And until then, I will see you on the next episode. Peace. West Coast, Fresh Coast, LA all day. Oh